So I thought that um, talk tonight about one of my personal favorite teachings of the Buddha. And it's the first time in the historic, uh, in the life of the Buddha, where he gives like a, re a, a talk to a really big audience. And it's one of the first Dharma talks that he gives. He um, comes to his own awakening through his meditation practice after studying concentration techniques and rejecting that as the path and then studying, uh, practicing asceticism and rejecting that sort of self-denial. And he comes to what he refers to as the middle way under the Bodhi tree, liberation through mindfulness and compassion. And, and then the first talk that he gives is to his five <laughs> friends that he'd been practicing asceticism with. And it's the first teaching, which is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, what we call the setting in motion, the, the Dharma, the wheel of, of truth. Shortly after he gives that first Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path talk, uh, he runs into uh, a couple of other people and gives them some really short instructions and kind of basically just says to them, uh, you know, everything's impermanent. <laughs> And they like get enlightened right away. And like, oh yeah, everything's impermanent. <laughs> this is like a simple transmission. And uh, and then it goes like from one enlightened being, just the Buddha, to him and his five homies, like six enlightened beings, and then and there's like twelve enlightened beings. I forget exactly the number, but uh, and then he he they all are 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 in Varanasi, outside of Varanasi, near the Ganges. And they're, they're taking a stroll, and they come upon uh, hundreds, I think it's like 500 or 600 um, fire worshippers. This whole big camp, uh, like they stumble on Burning Man. <laughs> These 12 enlightened dudes <laughs> stumble upon Burning Man. <laughs> Burning Man in like 89 when it was on the beach in San Francisco. <laughs> 600 people. And I don't know a lot, and it's not actually in the, in the traditional teachings, it's not explained uh, very clearly exactly what the practice of the fire worshippers are. But it does talk about them uh, kind of building fires and there's some sort of meditative discipline and devotional discipline towards either like fire gods or staring into the fire as, and they all have dreadlocks and are wearing um, kind of like uh, cloths of bark. So you get the picture of these like crazy dreadlocks, sadhu, rasta, I, I always like to add that uh, there is a tradition in Hinduism, a traditional Shivite worship, uh, Hinduism of smoking hash. So I like to think of him like coming upon these stoners, <laughs> 600 fire worshiping, hash smoking, dreadlock wearing, bark cloth <laughs> adorned. Get the picture? <laughs> And they have a teacher, right? They have a guru, a master that is sort of leading the ceremonies. And, um, and then the Buddha and uh, this, I, forget, I think maybe the name was Alara Kalama, something like that. This, this, uh, that was one of his teachers anyways. They start to have this debate about like who has the best practice and the best teaching and who's more enlightened and... Who's got the best weed? I don't know. <laughs> the way that this is written is that he's already uh, convinced the first group of fire worshippers that uh, Buddhism, that the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, is a, a good thing. And now they're going downstream, and there's another uh, group that they're about to encounter. I'll read to you this translation. It said, And the Blessed One went forth from Gaiasis near Gaia, 
together with the company of 1,000 monks. There the Blessed One addressed the monks. Everything, O oh monks, is burning. And how, O oh monks, is everything burning? The eye is burning, visible things are burning. The mental impressions based on the eye are burning. Contact of the eye with visible things is burning. Sensation produced by the contact of the eye with visible things, be it pleasant, be it painful, be it neither pleasant nor painful, that is also burning. With that fire it is burning. I declare unto you that it is burning with the fire of greed, the fire of hatred, and the fire of ignorance. It is burning with the anxieties of birth, of death, of decay, of grief, lamentation, suffering, dejection, and despair. And then he goes on to say this about all of the sense doors. The ear is burning, sounds are burning, uh, the nose is burning, odors are burning, the tongue is burning, tastes are burning, body is burning, objects of contact are burning. The mind is burning, thoughts are burning. Burning with the fire of greed, of anger and hatred and ignorance. Considering this, a disciple walking the noble path becomes wary of the eye, weary of visible things, weary of mental impressions based on the eye, weary of contact of the eye with visible things, weary also of the sensations produced by contact, be it pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful. He or she becomes weary of the ear and so forth, down to thoughts, becoming weary of all that one divests oneself of grasping, all of the objects that we attach to. By absence of grasping, one is made free. By non-attachment, one is liberated. When one is free, one becomes aware that one is free, and one realizes that rebirth or this sort of repetitive, burning suffering has been exhausted, and that there is no further return <coughs> to this experience of getting burned, of suffering. When this exposition was propounded, the minds of those thousand monks became free from attachment to the world and re were released from all entanglement, all causes of suffering. That'd be nice if you could just get a really good Dharma talk and your mind would just be released from the entanglements. Part of the Buddha's realization and poor teaching We're, we're a basic understanding of how we are wired, how this body is wired with uh, a survival instinct, the fight or flight that so much of what the eye, ear, nose, body, mind is experiencing is experiencing this craving, constant craving. What he's calling to the what he's saying to the uh, fire worshippers is, is burning, burning with greed. And that the eye by itself, and, and and part of I like this is that it's this normalizing of how impersonal craving is, how impersonal aversion is, how it's actually not your fault that you crave and cling and attach and get entangled <clears throat> in seeking pleasure as the source of your well-being, source of your happiness. That that burning of greed is uh, built in. Do you hear the way he's saying that? It's in the eye. It's in the objects of the eye. This is the way that it is. The survival instinct of the human condition is such 
that it craves for pleasure in order to survive. You have to crave for pleasure in order to survive. Perhaps you've noticed that you're naturally drawn towards pleasant sights and smells and tastes <laughs> and sensations. And of course, it gets a little tricky because what's pleasant and what is unpleasant is definitely in the eye of the beholder, in the preferences, <laughs> perhaps even tonight when somebody told you what their favorite band was and you're like, oh God, I can't stand that. <laughs> Your perception and their per what brings one person joy to their ear to another is like nails on a chalkboard. But it's your perception. It's your craving. It's your aversion. And it's how identified we are with our conditioned preferences. How addicted we are to uh, the craving, to satisfying the craving, to post postponing our happiness and our well-being until we get what we want. The mind says, I can't be happy until I have a pleasant experience of one kind or another. I can't be happy until this painful experience goes away. I can't be at ease. I think some people hear this and think it's a little extreme. It's all burning. It's all on fire. And I think that what's really being said is that uh, as long as you're identified with it, as long as you believe that you have that it has to be a certain way, that it has to be pleasant, that the pain has to go away, you're going to be suffering. You're going to be burning. That what mindfulness does, what meditation does, discipline, renunciation does, is that it changes our relationship to the craving mind. To the craving eye, the craving tongue, the craving body, the tendency of attachment and aversion of all of these sense doors. It changes our relationship to it so that we have some freedom around it. I like that last term where he says, uh, you're not entangled. That liberation is a detangling of our relationship to the eye and the objects that we see, to our body and the sensations that the body experiences, to the mind and the cravings, the aversions, the judgments, the fears that the mind experiences. It's an untangling and a beginning to see how uh, very much impersonal one of the key insights, the liberating insights of Buddhism is seeing uh, anatta, not self. And one of the ways to talk about not self is to understand that there is a universal, impersonal human experience going on here. <coughs> it is all burning. You're born into a Body. I've got small children. Many of you are parents, or some of you were children at some point. <laughs> Watching how this survival instinct, uh, this craving, this burning that the Buddha is talking about, is not taught. This is not nurture. This is not conditioning. This is biological. This is what we are born with. This is the evolved human species, animal, instinctual. I want pleasure. I don't want pain. Some of us have enough pain early enough in our life uh, from people uh, that are supposed to be the source of, of love that we can get our wires crossed a bit sometimes, and actually get into a, a habitual pattern of seeking 
maybe love in painful situations. Sometimes it looks like people like pain. You know people like that. You're like that sometimes, perhaps. Kind of look like, well, do I just love pain? Because I keep putting myself in these painful situations over and over. The Buddha says we're supposed to just crave for pleasure, but I tend to put myself in these painful situations. So sometimes I'm not, it's more pop psychology than it is Dharma, but it feels like sometimes our wires get crossed. And what we think is going to be a source of happiness is repeating patterns that are painful. I love the fact that that the Buddha uh, speaks in the language of the people that he's meeting. Right? These are fire worshippers, so he's using the analogy of fire. And you know, if he'd come upon surfers, he would have given a totally different <laughs> talk about riding the waves of your karma, or <clears throat> you know, not, not suffering about you know when there's no swell. <laughs> craving for swell or how it's really about the audience that it's not just sort of set it's like in this context you guys know about burning you know about fire let's talk about the dharma in this context the, um, he uses fire a lot and even liberation itself what we know as Nirvana, the third noble truth, the fact that a nirvana or in the Pali language, a nibbana is, is attainable by all beings. It also has to do with fire. Nibbana, some would say it means extinguishing the flames. It's an extinguishing of the flames of greed and hatred and delusion, that that's actually what our whole goal as uh, Dharma practitioners is, to put out greed, hatred, and delusion. I like to think about it rather than extinguishing as uh, changing our relationship to. Uh, I tend to feel like if you have a human body, you're still going to have a survival instinct that is craving, that manifests as kind of craving and greed and lust. Uh, as long as you're still in this physical form, that's just what these physical forms do. They hate pain. They love pleasure. Nibbana, I'm told, and I like this bit better, is actually a cooking term that means to take the pot off of the fire. Not to extinguish the flames, but to remove from the flames. And that there's a way that... Uh, our awakening, our consciousness, our practice can bring us to a place where we're not getting burned by the cravings anymore. We're not getting burned by the aversion anymore. We change our relationship to the mind, not ignoring the mind, not perfecting the mind, but, change, but perfecting our relationship to the mind to the survival instinct. You have a survival instinct. It's gotten you in a lot of trouble, perhaps you've noticed. <laughs> it makes relationships in this impermanent world really difficult because part of that is a craving for permanence, is a craving for security, is a craving for stability. We're wired to want this stability. But we live, actually, in a world where there's no stability. There's no permanence. There's no security. It's all delusional. When we're feeling secure, delusional. When you're feeling like uh, <clears throat> it's temporary. And if we're not living in the understanding that it's temporary, that the security is temporary, then it's uh, tenuous. And 
I know there's some people in the room that are thinking, but what about the joy? Is it all suffering? Is it all burning? My own feeling of like hearing these teachings and applying these teachings is that the more I've related to the craving, the burning, the attachment, all of the ways that I've caused myself so much suffering, that human beings cause ourselves so much suffering, and changed my relationship to it, as we change our relationship to greed and hatred and delusion, it makes so much more room for joy. So much more room for meeting the pain with compassion. And then there's no suffering about the pain. Meeting the pleasant experiences, and there's so many pleasant experiences available to us, rather than taking them hostage and ruining them, rather than taking our friends and our relationships hostage and getting attached and controlling and clinging and ruin fucking it up. <laughs> Non-attached appreciation being connected to each other without clinging to each other feels quite good. Actually makes life uh, easier, for sure. I want to say more pleasant. Uh, sometimes it's more pleasant. <laughs> The Buddha is really good at pointing out the problem. This is another one of the teachings where it points out what's getting in the way of your happiness. If you believe the cravings of the eye, the ear, the tongue, the mind, the body, if you believe that you need pleasant smells, pleasant sights, pleasant sensations in order to be content, you're going to be fucked half of the time, <laughs> because it's not going to be pleasant. Maybe more than half of the time. But when you break that belief, then you don't have to suffer about the fact that uh, a lot of the time it doesn't sound right. If those cars would just stop driving by, I could be at peace. A lot of the times it doesn't smell right. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't feel right. When we break our addiction to it being pleasant, and we learn to tolerate unpleasantness, to meet unpleasantness with compassion, ultimately we're going for compassion, not just tolerance. Caring about responding with mercy, with forgiveness. Then nobody can ruin your day ever again. <laughs> Everything becomes an opportunity for practice. Oh, my leg's falling asleep. Interesting. <laughs> and offering this merit out in all directions, sharing it with our own commitment to your own awakening and a commitment to creating a positive change in this world, to being engaged in compassionate action, to being part of the solution. <laughs>